Hey everyone, welcome to HR McMillan Space Center, uh, our online weekly Q&A sessions. Uh, this is our, I think this is our second week uh, that we've been doing these. Uh, I can't remember, time is... Uh Time is uh, very strange these days. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. For the next half an hour, we're going to be doing uh, our uh, Q and A's uh, with our astronomer Rachel. Hey, Rachel, how's it going? Hello. Hello. It goes really well. I'm very excited for this topic, actually. <laughs> yes, our topic this week is our place in the universe. Now, Rachel, when I go outside and I've been looking up at the stars recently, and thinking about distances really starts to warp my brain <laughs> because it's, it's, it's enough. It's one thing to kind of like think about, you know, traveling, you know, uh, across the country, like uh, a flight to Toronto or a flight to, uh, to Montreal. Uh, last year I went to Paris and Armenia and those are, those are like long flights. Um, but to start to think about like the distances, not just like our moon, but to like places in our solar system and like places in our universe, it's a wild um, a thought process to just think about those, uh, that type of space that is needed uh, in the universe. Yeah, I try not to think about it too hard. Otherwise, I would never get anything done. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our topic uh, for today. Rachel is going to do a short uh, little presentation on our place in the universe, all on distances. Uh, but we also have some really exciting activities. And this is our first week of partnership with Let's Talk Science. Uh, Morgan Alford, uh, who works out at UBC, um, getting her PhD, uh, she did a really cool activity that if you want to, um, to play along with us, on our weekly themes. Um, this week's theme, of course, is distances and scale. And one of the things that you can do with scale is think about the different sizes of the planets in our solar system. So this week's activity was paper mache planets. Uh, and this is a super cool. Uh, I, ca I can't get, uh, wait to get started on my paper mache planets. Uh, I'm not very crafty, but I'm going to give it a shot. I've been doing some cooking, you know, so this is a time to experiment. So I'm going to do some experimenting, see, uh, see what we can come up with. Um, so the link to that, uh, that video, did a little interview with Morgan, is in the description of our YouTube uh, channel here, uh, as well as some extra resources. So we'll refer to that a little bit later on. Uh, also, uh, this week, uh, we are live on TELUS Optic TV. So if you're watching on TELUS Optic TV, uh, welcome. Um, if you uh, want to interact with us, because this is a Q&A session, we're going to be uh, able to ask Rachel uh, questions. Um, we're going to start with uh, questions that are on the topic of scale and, and distance in the universe. And then, and of course, we'll just open it up to any questions you have. Uh, of course, you have to do that in the YouTube chat. So if you're in the YouTube chat right now, uh, say hello. Say uh, where you're uh, watching from. Uh, if you're in Vancouver, like Rachel and I are, or maybe you're somewhere else in the country, maybe somewhere else in the world, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, and uh, we'll try to figure out uh, our distances. Maybe we can do some quick calculations uh, <laughs> on that. Uh, but for now, let's start off with a quick little presentation uh, with you, Rachel, about uh, our place in the universe, and then we'll open up some questions. Sure. Yeah, so this is a very interesting topic for me, especially because the hardest part about astronomy is that the things that we're trying to study are millions and billions of light years away. So we can't physically touch them or interact with them. But thankfully, astronomers have come up with a really clever solution for that. Now, you might have seen our Earth Day Cosmic Nights back near the end of April, where I broke the universe down into nine frames and then flew us through to the different scales of the universe. But this time I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to talk about how astronomers measure cosmic distances because, as Michael said, space is really, really big. Now, our brains struggle to comprehend just how big the universe is. Everything on Earth, even the planet itself, is very tiny when compared to the scale of our universe. And because of this, astronomers had to invent a new way of measuring distances using the fastest thing in the universe. And that, of course, is light. But not all astronomical bodies of interest are extremely far away, so astronomers have constructed something called the Cosmic Distance Ladder, in which different methods are used to determine distances to objects, and the specific method used depends on how far away the object is, with each measurement building on the last. Now the first rung in our distance ladder is for distances within our solar system, and that is radar or laser ranging. Now, this measurement method relies on the cosmic speed limit of light in that it always travels at the speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. Now, when a pulse of light, like a radio pulse, is directed at a nearby planetary body, part of that signal will be reflected back. And by using basic kinematics formulae that you might have seen in high school physics, 
and timing how long it takes for this light echo to return. Then dividing this time by two, multiplying by the speed of light, the distance to a nearby object can be determined. And this method is actually routinely used to measure the Earth-Moon distance. Mirrors left on the surface of the moon by the Apollo 11, 14, and 15 astronauts as part of the laser ranging retroflector experiment reflect a laser beam shot from Earth and allow scientists to measure the round trip distance. Now, what about distances to the nearest stars? Uh, distances around a few hundred light years or so? Well, we use a geometric method called stellar parallax. And you're probably already familiar with parallax because your eyes and brain use it to see. So there's a quick experiment we can try. Uh, you can hold out your finger in front of your nose, close one eye, and note where your finger appears on the back wall. And then if you switch which eye is open, you should see that your finger against the back wall moves a little bit. Now, if we repeat this experiment and you extend your finger all the way out, so your arm is extended, and do the same thing where you close your eyes and switch to the other, you'll notice that the movement of your finger against the back wall is actually a lot smaller than it was when you held your finger out um, in front of your nose. So parallax is really the apparent shift of an object's position relative to more distant or background objects, things like background stars. And that's caused by a change in the observer's position. For us, it was us closing which eye. And for the Earth, it's on what side of the sun we are at. Now, the first successful measurements of stellar parallax were made by someone named Frederick Bessel in 1838 on the star 61 Cygni. Now today, parallaxes can only be measured for stars out to around 500 light years or so. And because our galaxy is approximately 100,000 light years in diameter, this only includes a small fraction of the total numbers in our galaxy. So how can distances to stars even further away be determined? Well, astronomers make use of one of the most useful and powerful plots in astrophysics, and that's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or HR diagram for short. And it looks something like this on the left. It originated in 1911 when Danish astronomer Ejnar Hertzsprung plotted the luminosity of stars against their color. And then independently in 1913, American astronomer Henry Norris Russell plotted the spectral class of stars against their luminosity. And by combining the two plots together, they produced the HR diagram that we have today. Now, by using main sequence stars, and these, are main, these main sequence stars are stable stars that are continually fusing hydrogen in their cores, and the HR diagram, astronomers can compare a cluster's location on the diagram to a cluster of stars with well-known distances from parallax, just like this here on the right. And then from a simple conversion from brightness to distance, or what we call the distance modulus, uh, the vertical distance between these clusters gives us the distance to the unknown cluster. So the main sequence fitting relies on our previous rung in our distance ladder, which was parallax. Now, the next one on the ladder is for measuring distances in our galaxies and to those nearby. We use something called Cepheid variables, which are stars that brighten and dim periodically. Now, this behavior allows them to be used as cosmic yardsticks out to distances of a few tens of millions of light years. And it was Henrietta Leavitt in 1912 who was the first to recognize that there was a relationship between the pulsation periods and the luminosity of Cepheids. She recognized that larger, brighter Cepheids have longer pulsation periods, although she was unaware of the exact relationship that they had. And it wasn't until Harlow Shapley, who later calibrated the Cepheids and related the periods of the pulsation to their luminosity, which actually led to the first estimate of the size of the Milky Way. Now to other galaxies that are around a billion light years away, astronomers can no longer use methods like parallax or Cepheid variables. Now at such large distances, parallax shift becomes too small and we can no longer see individual stars and galaxies. So instead we use type 1a supernova, whose distances are known from some previous method that we've covered and watch as it brightens and dims. And these are called standard candles. Now a supernova is a violently exploding star. They can produce as much energy as an entire galaxy for a short period of time. And historically have, some of them have been visible in the daytime. However, they are rather rare, and ast astronomers estimate that only one or two occur each century in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, astronomers recognize that there are two main types of supernovae. The one that we're talking about, type 1, involve a white dwarf that is part of a binary system, meaning that they have a companion. So a white dwarf is an Earth-sized ball of carbon and oxygen nuclei that's nearing the end of its life. The gravity of a white dwarf is opposed by some sort of electron pressure in the center, 
and there's actually an upper mass limit known as a Chandra Sekar limit. Now, if the white dwarf happens to eat a lot of material and accum accumulate a lot of material from its companion binary star, its mass will, might just exceed this mass limit, which causes a supernova. And that means that the white dwarf will be destroyed in a sudden burst of fusion and no remnant is left behind. Now, because supernova are such, such energetic events, astronomers can actually observe them at really great distances. If you see in the figure to the right, this is Tycho's nova. The supernova is clearly bright enough to be distinguished from its host galaxy. Now for very, very far objects, so more than a billion light years away, none of these methods work. Now scientists are now required to move away from direct observations to using observations with theory. Now the theory used to determine these very great distances in the universe is actually based on a discovery by Edwin Hubble that the universe is actually expanding. In 1929, Hubble announced that almost all galaxies appeared to be moving away from us, and the further away they were, the faster they appeared to be moving away. Now, this phenomena was observed as redshift of a galaxy's spectrum, and this redshift appeared to be larger or faint for presumably further galaxies. Now, our current estimate of the universe's age is around 13.8 billion years old, with an uncertainty of around 120 million years. Now, any light that we must must have any light that we see must have been traveling for 13.8 billion years or less. And so we call this the observable universe. However, the distance to the edge of the observable universe is around 46 billion light years because the universe has been expanding all this time. Now, if you imagine a photon of light being emitted from a point on the edge of the observable universe, while that photon has been traveling through space, the universe has expanded and we've moved away from the point where that light has emitted and it hasn't moved away from us. So even though the light may have only traveled for 13.8 billion years, the distance from us to that point that it came from at present is actually 46 billion light years. This also means that any object that is farther away from us than light could travel in the age of the universe simply cannot be detected as the signals could not have reached us yet. So when we observe an object that is 13 billion light years away, we are observing it as it was 13 billion years ago when the universe was in its infancy. Being able to look back into the early stages of the universe will help us understand how it's formed. And if we look back far enough, we might be able to see the first stars and galaxies as they were just forming. And this is what we're hoping that the James Webb Space Telescope will do for us. As the successor and the complement to the Hubble Telescope, JWST is an orbiting infrared observatory with longer wavelength coverage and vastly improved sensitivity over Hubble. Now the longer wavelengths will help JWST look much closer toward the beginning of time to hunt for the unobserved formation of the first galaxies and peer into the dust clouds where stars and planetary systems are forming today. Now with Hubble's sharp eyed wide field camera, they extended the parallax measurements further than previously thought possible, all the way across the Milky Way galaxy. Now to get accurate distances to nearby galaxies, the team looked for galaxies containing both Cepheids and type 1a supernovae. Now type 1a supernovae always have the same brightness and are also bright enough to be seen at relatively large distances. And by comparing the observed brightness of both types of stars in these nearby galaxies, the team could then accurately measure the true brightness of the supernova. Now using this calibrated rung on the distance ladder, the accurate distance to additional 300 type 1a supernova and far-flung galaxies was calculated. And then a team of researchers compared those distance measurements with how the light from the supernova is stretched to longer wavelengths by the expansion of space. And finally, they used these two values to calculate how fast the universe expands with time. And that's something called the Hubble constant. And I think that's really cool that they were able to take these two rungs on the distance ladder, the Cepheid variables and the type 1a standard candle supernovas to measure the actual expansion rate of our universe. And I think that that's just a, that is just incredible. And so that brings me to the end of my talk. Michael, I'll throw it back to you and let's get the ball rolling on our Q&A. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rachel. Wow. You have uh, not only like taken us to the edge of the universe, but uh, I think also expanded our brains and uh, thinking about um, 
this place in the universe. Uh, so yeah, put uh, some questions in the chat um, about any of that. But Rachel, let's. I'd like to also sort of like bring it back uh, to our local neighborhood in, in thinking about distances because of course, we're thinking about our place in the universe. A lot of like the stars that we're thinking of, we're observing them, but we're not really thinking about going there. Mm -hmm. right like they're just like we're, the distances we're talking about are places that we observe but we're not thinking about that we can like send a spaceship there exactly like if we're thinking of like the nearest star system which is proxima centauri it would take it's 4.6 i think uh light years away and it would be far too far for humans to travel and survive that length of travel Right. And so I always think about when I think about like cosmology and, you know, thinking about studying the universe and then there's like space exploration. And of course, you think of those two things as being like connected, but they're almost like two separate things. You know, like when we're thinking about space exploration, we're not thinking about exploring these distant stars. <laughs> we're thinking about exploring uh, our local neighborhood, which also has its own physical distance challenges. So if you're just like, just um, think about that for a little bit, because we want to sort of like feed sort of like both uh, ends of those questions, you know, thinking about the far galaxies, but also maybe even thinking about the challenges of the distances within our own solar system. Um, let's think about the closest place to the moon. So um, how long has it uh, on average taken for, uh, for us to get to the moon? It's around three or four days, if I recall correctly, for especially for the Apollo missions as well. Yeah, okay. around four days. So, so three or four days. So that, that's that's a nice little road trip. Uh, not not so bad. Um, so uh, Venus is uh, not going to be a destination that we're going to be sending people <laughs> to. But the next closest place is Mars. So how long is the trip for us to get to Mars? Uh, I believe it's anywhere from six months to 500 days. And if you think about it, it's not just like we can send a spaceship whenever we're ready. We have to wait until earth and mars are in prime positions in their orbit so we can travel the shortest distance because if you imagine if earth was on let's say the right side of the sun and then mars is on the left it would take a lot a lot of fuel <laughs> to send uh people to mars that way so we try to wait for uh when earth and mars are at their closest approach with each other before we send people yeah and then of course beyond that at, you know, we haven't quite, we think about sending people, but we are thinking about sending missions to uh, Jupiter's moon Europa. We do have Juno uh, around that right now. And then of course, Saturn, lots of intriguing places. Um, but that's like the next level of, uh, of distance. Like that's, you're talking about the years uh, mm. when you talk about trying to get to Jupiter and Saturn, right? It's even hard to imagine um, Voyager 1 and 2 left our solar system. And that feels like it took a very long time <laughs> for them to get all the way out there. So I can't even imagine what it would be like to even send a human to Jupiter. Although I would like to volunteer if anyone is looking for, <laughs> for someone yeah. to go. Yeah, I always like to, th uh, to think about uh, Voyager 1 and 2 as sort of like being my siblings because we were uh, born the same year. So as far as uh, the whole mission that Voyager 1 and 2 have been on is the exact amount of time that I've been alive on this planet. So uh, <laughs> that gives you a little bit of hint as to how old I am. Uh, <laughs> all right, we've got some questions coming in. Uh, keep putting them into the chat. We're going to start with our distance questions, and then we're going to open it up to uh, any and all your questions uh, until we hit the 2.30 mark. So our first question comes from Pride Volts. Is Parsec a real measure of distance? Now, of course, Parsec came up in our uh, chat, our Star Wars uh, chat. It did. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what a parsec is. Sure. So a parsec is, um, it's really 3.26 light years. And the reason why it's not some round number like three, it's 3.26. It's because it's really measuring um, the angle or the distance that uh, if you drew a line from the Earth to the sun, um, that line sweeping out one second of arc, that's a distance of 3.26 light years. Now, I do have a gripe with units in astronomy and measurements in astronomy. And that is, I feel like we just come up with the most ridiculous units ever and make it just so hard for people <laughs> to understand what we're talking about. And an example of this is actually the ERG, which is part of the centimeter gram seconds CGS system of units. And we're used to doing the System International SI units. Um, now the CGS unit called the ERG is actually the equivalent of one housefly doing a push-up. And I think that that is just <laughs> both crazy and amazing at the same time. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, all right. Um, our next question actually is maybe a very personal one uh, for mm -hmm. you, Rachel. And uh, you have been our astronomer here at the Space Center for um, almost a year. Is it more than a year? Almost a year. So July 15th will be one year at the Space Center for me. 
Awesome. So yeah. the question is, you know, probably there's probably a lot of young people uh, out there on the chats uh, who want to know, how do you become an astronomer? That's a really good question. You know, a lot of people always ask, like, how do you go through um, the schooling? What kind of program should I be in? How, what's the best way um, in terms of academia to be on the right track to be an astronomer? And I always answer that it really starts with a passion for it. You know, there's uh, people who are much younger than me, 13 or 14, who have built their own telescopes by grinding out their own mirrors and uh, wow. doing it that way and doing backyard amateur astronomy. And, you know, I went the the academia route. Mm -hmm. But I would say that like, you really just start with a passion for it and seeing, um, you know, going outside and starting those own projects by yourself, um, doing citizen science projects is a really good way to start. Um, but if you're thinking about doing astronomy as a full time professional career, then you do, I, unfortunately, do have to, uh, you have to go to school for a little, a little while, um, at minimum, you need a master's. And if you're teaching, then you definitely need a doctorate degree, which right. is a uh, my plan for the future. <laughs> so you, when you first started your schooling, was was this sort of like what you had in mind that you did want to become an astronomer or was it something that, you know, you were kind of dabbled here and there because most people in my, myself, I certainly dabbled a lot. I went to business school, I went to film school, you know, you got to try different things. So did you take that direct path or did, uh, did astronomy kind of like <laughs> uh, pop up to you a little bit later? Uh, yes, gosh, no, it, it definitely, um, was kind of fortuitous how it happened. Like I went to UBC originally um, intending to go into pharmacology and microbiome immunology. So a much different path. And then I took a first year biology course and I decided that it was not for me at all. Um, and when I was choosing courses for the second semester of my first year, um, that's when I saw that there was an astronomy course, a first, first level, first year level astronomy course. And I decided to give it a shot. And what I loved about that and the subsequent courses that I had in my program was that every time I went to lecture, you know, my mouth would always be so dry because my mouth is open all the time in awe of what, <laughs> what my uh, professors were saying. So that really solidified that path for me. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and of course, like anyone out there on the chat, you know, thinking about, you know, this sort of field, you did bring up citizen science, which is, mm -hmm. you know, I feel that astronomy uh, is one of those sciences that really works with citizen science really well so that you mm -hmm. don't need to, you know, grind out four to six years or however long to get uh, to get your degree. You can just get that telescope in your backyard or go on to um, some of the websites that um, that are looking for people to go through some data to do some actual real science. Um, we do have some examples of that. Um, uh, from Zooniverse, which we mentioned last week in our uh, in our live chat. So if you do want to do some citizen science, what are some examples that uh, people might want to get into when it comes to distances? Uh, or I guess our, our galaxy, yeah. So we have a couple. Um, so the first one that I'm gonna be showing with you is uh, characterizing spiral galaxies. And Michael, can you see my screen right now? with uh, the spiral and galaxy, okay, great. So it's really asking you to look through these black and white images and figure out what type of galaxy it is. And it's asking you to draw and indicate where the arms actually on the spiral galaxy are. And I think this is really interesting, especially when talking about our topic uh, this week for our place in the universe, because we live on the Orion arm um, of the Milky Way. So if we imagine that this is the Milky Way galaxy, we live about eh, kind of the suburbia neighborhood of the Milky Way, far away from the downtown hubbub of our local black hole. And so what's really cool about this project is it actually walks you through um, a tutorial on how to classify these different um, different galaxies and the characters of these galaxies. And at the end, um, once a paper gets published based on all this data, you'll actually get your name published on a paper as part of a nice. science project, which I <laughs> think is really, really cool. You can just do that from the comfort of your own home in sweatpants. And now, <laughs> uh, here's another one, um, also from Zooniverse, which is looking for Planet Nine. Now, it's looking for Planet Nine in something called the Trans-Neptunian region. So it's really that um, region where Pluto and Neptune are. And you're basically looking for these particular markings. And so you'll watch a short clip and play the animation, and then you'll be able to see things move. And then you'll uh, be asked to take a marker. Oh, maybe you'll play this animation right now. So you see, watch it. And then you really just want to select where you see a bright, um, what they call dipole and place a marker there. And so that's helping them look for um, potentially other worlds in this trans region. Hmm. 
Really interesting. Um, we have a sort of a related question, um, you know, about these other worlds, um, which comes to us from Harry Wong. So in our immediate area, H2O, water and carbon, um, those are like the basic building blocks of life. And certainly um, the uh, signatures that we're looking for um, when we're trying to find life. Um, but when we start thinking about these other places, these other solar systems um, that we've been looking for, and we talked about it during our um, exoplanet chat mm -hmm. um, last week, um, is what are, is there possibility of, of unknown chemicals or unknown variables that may give us some clues as to um, some new building block signatures? Well, I would say 100%. Um... The thing to think about is when we're looking for exoplanets, when we're looking for extraterrestrial life, we're really starting from what we know. We're starting from a place of familiarity. So we're looking for Earth-like exoplanets and we're looking for life that is carbon-based and looks a lot like us because that's the only thing that we know. It's the only thing that we're familiar with. It's our only data point in the sample of is there other forms of intelligent extraterrestrial life out there. So because of this, I often say that our search is limited because there could be a planet out there that is more efficient for hosting human life. We have no idea. We're just looking for ones that are similar to the one that we have, the planet that we have right now that works for us. So for places like, for example, Titan, which is Saturn's largest moon, it has these liquid methane lakes on its surface. So if there was, by some chance, methane-based life forms, they would thrive on a moon like Titan. But so far, we haven't had any indications, and we're still sending out science instruments to sniff planets for uh, signs of water and carbon and any other kind of uh, compounds that would be a source of chemical energy. Yeah, it certainly seems like that mission to Titan is one of the ones that is exciting a lot of uh, astronomers, especially in this search yes. for life. Um, and even in thinking about um, um, if we can find new kinds of life on a place like Titan, how that really opens up the possibilities when we start to look for these other worlds. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we've only got a few more, a few more minutes um, before we get, uh, before, before we wrap this up. There's a really funny uh, question uh, from Mike Lee Torres, which I don't know if you can uh, tackle Rachel, but we'll, we'll see, uh, but it, it, it is related to distance. Okay. And it has to do with the heat of our sun. So how close would you need to get to the sun to cook a steak oh. just based on how close you could get to the sun? Um, that's a great question. I have to admit something to you, Michael. I've never cooked red meat before <laughs> in my life. So I don't actually know the temperature that uh, a steak would cook at. But I do know that the sun is a few million degrees Celsius or 50 yeah. million degrees um, Celsius. So I imagine that if we put a stake on the Parker Solar Probe that's actually heading on its way um, to the sun in a series of flybys, uh, I imagine that it wouldn't have to get that close to be cooked. <laughs> uh, medium, medium rare. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm a vegetarian, so, you know, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> But certainly, but the thing about, you know, certainly like the heat of the sun, um, it does get very hot. Uh, but if that spacecraft, you know, turned away from the sun, uh, say like the, the other side of the spacecraft, which isn't facing the sun, it would, of course, it would get super cold. So mm -hmm. you might uh, have some, some tricky variables uh, um, if you're cooking that steak. It's like you have it uh, facing the heat, but then as soon as you take it away, then you're in, then you've frozen it. So <laughs> I don't know if you want to eat it. I've never been very good at cooking, so I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, another question uh, about uh, oh, the uh, next uh, the next female to go to the moon. Um, now uh, we are going to be talking about um, living in space uh, very soon in a couple of weeks because we're going to be uh, there's a brand new a uh, rocket uh, that SpaceX has built that is going to be taking uh, astronauts up to the space station in a couple of weeks. Um, so in two weeks' time, we're going to be focusing on living in space, but. The Artemis program that NASA has announced, they have announced that the next person to walk on the moon is going to be a woman. They haven't announced who that's going to be. Um, but we do have some some Canadian connections that, um, you know, might be a candidate. I'm very excited for the first female to walk on the lunar surface. I think it's been <laughs> it's been over 50 years. <laughs> I'm very excited. 
Yeah. Uh, so Jenny Saidi is a is a Canadian astronaut. Um, uh, I'm not sure if, if she's going to be the next Canadian astronaut to go into space uh, or maybe go to the moon. Uh, but she would definitely be in that category. Although mm -hmm. I kind of think if NASA is uh, is uh, leading the mission, they'll probably pick an American to be the first person. You know, which kind of kind of sucks. But you know, they're the ones uh, footing most of the bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another random question about uh, Starlink satellites uh, affecting astronomers and hobbyists. Well, oh. how, do you, how do you feel about uh, the Starlink satellites? This is uh, one of the questions that my friends always ask me at dinner parties because it gets me really riled up. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so there is a big issue um, with the Starlink satellites. You know, Elon Musk is, I think the current plan is to put 12,000 up there, but he wants to extend it to the, some range of 46,000, I think, is the number. And the problem with the satellites is that, um, you know, you can actually see uh, things like Iridium satellites or space debris or even the ISS flying across the nighttime sky. And his solution was, well, maybe we can paint them black. And that's a big problem for us because we do a lot of uh, astronomy in the infrared or the near infrared. For example, the James Webb Space Telescope that I was mm -hmm. talking about before. And that's because infrared helps us see through things like dust clouds into the heart of uh, nurseries that have um, baby stars in them. Yeah. And so if we paint something in the black, well, um, just by going outside in the summer with uh, black hair or wearing black t-shirt, you get a lot warmer than if you were to wear, let's say, white. So if you were to paint these Starlink satellites black, then they would absorb a lot of the heat and they would actually be brighter in the infrared than if you didn't paint them black. So yeah. his first proposed solution I have uh, major qualms with. <laughs> um, but hopefully there is some sort of happy medium where we can have um, the Starlink satellites and also not have them interfering all that much with um, astronomy. Yeah, and certainly as we as we go forward, as we're seeing in a couple of weeks with SpaceX, you know, now partnering, you know, uh, con you know, the institutions, NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, the uh, European Space Agency, they're looking out to the private companies to now get involved, you know, but they have different priorities. And I think like mm -hmm. it's about collaboration and, you know, there may be, you know, some stumbling blocks along that way, like with any collaboration, but it's it's learning, you know, from these things. And uh, I think it's uh, in the end, I think it's it's a great opportunity uh for space exploration as a whole we're uh, what we're, boards. yeah yeah uh, Robert Richard, that comes to the end of our uh a session this week uh we are going to be back next thursday at 2 p.m uh what uh, have you got cooked up for us next week we're talking about gravity next week which i'm so excited about <laughs> so we're going to be delving into how gravity works are we going to be talking about just here on the earth what uh, how how big are we going to get oh probably on the scale of the whole universe Yep. Nice. All right. Uh, so make sure to join us uh, next uh, week, Thursday at two o'clock. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, watching us on YouTube and also on Telus Optic. Uh, and always, uh, please, um, if you have um, anything to uh, to donate to our programs, we would really appreciate. You can go onto our website, spacecenter.ca, and go to the donate now. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your feedback as well. Uh, if you go into the description of our YouTube channel, uh, you can get to a survey. Uh, let us know what kind of programming what topics you'd like to hear from we're going to be doing uh these online programs pretty much for the rest of the summer um so uh we're going to be doing some evening programming coming up as well so uh make sure to sign up to our mailing list so you uh know all about those uh well for me michael here in my kitchen uh rachel nice to see you see you next week everyone <laughs>